You'd have to go back 30 years to find a time when relations between the government of Ontario and the province's doctors is as bad as it's been over the past few years. The government unilaterally imposed a contract settlement on doctors and has, from time to time, tried to name and shame them over their incomes. But recently, the province gave in to a key demand of the docs, namely, to send future contract dispute issues to binding arbitration. And through it all, Ontario's doctors have been going through their own kind of in-house revolution. Where is it all shaking out? Well, let's ask Dr. Sean Watley, the new president of the Ontario Medical Association, and we are delighted to welcome you to TVO tonight. Thank you for the opportunity. Do you hate the new job yet? <laughs> I'm loving it. Really? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's not been exactly the most fun place that your predecessors have found to be. You know what? If there's a crisis going on, you want to be in the center of it. It's the greatest opportunity to make things better. Okay. In which case, what would you say at the moment is the prime source of the antipathy between the province and you? Well, I think the province has been stretched for cash, and they've thought that if they could get fiscal predictability on the backs of physicians and healthcare in general, they would try it. And so that, I, at least in my mind, is the source of why we got to where we are now. And yet, they, they, they kind of tossed you a bone not too long ago. They said that if there are outstanding issues, we will accede to your request to have those issues go to binding arbitration. Uh, that is something that they had resisted doing for months and months and months. Why do you think they exceeded? Well, I think this is something that physicians have been asking for for decades. It's something that's enshrined in the Canada Health Act, but we didn't have it until just recently. I think we got to a point where physicians said, we can't work if our power balance is so out of whack. If, the, if one person has the ability to unilaterally act against the other party in a negotiation, we, we, we aren't going to solve problems. And we negotiate to solve patient care problems. And so I think the, the government, Premier Wynne, stepped in and said, listen, let's get this done so that at least we can level the playing field so we can start solving patient care problems again. That's what we're both here to do. Now we have a framework in which to negotiate. I'm not going to play cynic. Well, maybe I'll play a little bit. You, you think the fact we're less than a year to an election had anything to do with that? I can't speak for the motivation. Oh, on the stop other it. Stop <laughs> it. Of course you can. Okay. Has that, in effect, made for a more constructive relationship between the province and the OMA? Well, absolutely. Now, when you use the word relationship, I would say we're taking baby steps towards building a working relationship based on equity and respect. I don't think we're all the way there yet, but certainly we have the structure to build a working relationship. Now we're in negotiations and we'll see how that goes. Now, I, I've also found over the years that when people say, you know, it's not about the money, it really is about the money. So let me just ask you directly, do doctors need a raise in this province? So great question, and I think it depends on which doctors you're looking at. We need to frame this question in terms of how will this impact patient care. So, and although, you know, you say people say it's not about the money, it actually isn't about the money, it's about solving patient care problems. So if we don't have a fee for me to, uh, to see 95-year-olds with diabetes in a, in a rural clinic, then all things being equal, some of the 95-year-olds won't get as much care as they need. So that's why we have negotiations to solve those patient care problems. But that sounds like, uh, but that is about the money. I mean, if you, mm -hmm. you, need, you need to be appropriately compensated in your view to provide the services that you want to provide to your patients. That's about money, isn't it? At the end of the day, it's about money. Well, definitely money is involved in attracting physicians to provide the kinds of care that our patients need. And so, of course, we're talking about money and incentives and programs and structure, and that's why we need a negotiated settlement to work that out. On top of it, we need to make sure that Ontario is an attractive place to draw the best talent possible to care for our patients. Because if we care about patients, we want to have the best talent here to care for them. Okay, that's about your relationship with the province. I now want to talk about your relationships inside the Ontario Medical Association, which have been fascinating over the past year. I gotta tell you, um, there was a palace coup. I mean, the previous leadership um, struck a deal with the provincial government, the membership rose up and rejected that deal and threw out the previous leadership. I want to get a better understanding of what you think the previous leadership clearly did not understand about the mood of the province's doctors today. Well, the, you're talking about the what was thrown out last summer, yeah. so the, the tentative contract. Well, that came on the heels of four years of cuts. So we've been cut every year since 2012. And, and 
although you can say, again, we can frame this in terms of how the docs feel personally, but what the docs are experiencing on the front line are the challenges of trying to provide care with less and less and less funding. So our costs for our staff are going up, costs for technology are going up, our leaseholds are going up, and yet we're being cut and cut and cut. At the same time, we're, we're trying to find creative solutions for our patients. And so in that environment, when we get a contract that didn't even offer to cover the baseline increases, in the needs for our province. We have 140,000 new patients every year, almost 1,000 new doctors every year in our province. So the province wasn't even offering to cover that basic level of growth. It's very difficult for doctors to, to say this is a good contract. I think it was a bad contract. The majority of members clearly agreed with you and rejected the contract, but the previous leadership, the president, the bargaining unit, et cetera, they did come to an agreement with the province of Ontario. Mm -hmm. Can you? Can I now at this Can time? Can you come to an agreement? I think the tables have turned completely. I think last year, like you said, it was a watershed moment. It was a history making. We keep saying we're making history. Over the last two years, every event has been making history. Um, I think that sent a clear message, and that's one of the reasons why we ended up with binding arbitration, a binding arbitration framework. I think. Uh, Premier Wynne and Minister Hoskins are committed to trying to hammer out a deal. They've said this publicly. They've said it to me when I met with them. And, and so again, docs are in a cautious relationship rebuilding exercise. And I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get to something perhaps early in the spring that will be good for docs, good for patients, and good for the province as a whole. Well, and if they do get an agreement in the spring, just a couple of months before the election, that would presumably be good for the government's political interests as well. Well, I'm, I'm not a politician. Oh, either. there you go again. Okay. <laughs> okay, get comfortable on this, Dr. Watley, because uh, I, I need to set this up a bit here. Uh, doctors, doctors really look like they're in the crosshairs a lot lately. And by that, I mean the federal government's tax changes are really going after doctors. And we know, we've already talked about how the province has unilaterally clawed back on doctors' fees and imposed contract settlements without the approval of the doctors. There's a splinter group in the province called Concerned Ontario Doctors. You know them well. They surveyed physicians and medical trainees early in September. 5,000 docs responded on the issues of burnout, fee cuts, the proposed federal tax changes. And I just want to share those results with our viewers and then get you to comment on them. Sheldon, there, thank you. 81% of docs reported feeling attacked or vilified by the Ontario government. 81%. 70% reported feeling attacked or vilified by the Canadian government. 69% report working longer or harder without improved personal or professional outcomes. 40% report working longer or harder without improved patient outcomes. 63% report feeling anxious about uncertainties around their own practices. And a little over half report government policy is influencing their practice rather than evidence-based clinical medicine, and obviously they don't like that notion. Now, let's state at the outset, this is not a scientific survey. Mm -hmm. This is a, uh, you know, you had to choose to respond, and the people who choose to respond tend to be more ticked off than those who don't. Mm -hmm. But how representative do you think those numbers are of how doctors in this province, in the main, feel about these issues? Well, I'm glad you mentioned whether or not this is representative or not. I think regardless of how statistically sound this data is, we need to take it seriously. Docs have been through an incredibly difficult time. And then when I met with Minister Morneau, in fact, just a, a few weeks ago the in Ottawa, minister. yeah, the finance minister, federal finance minister, I said, I've never seen doctors so worried, so stressed, and in many cases, so downright angry at the fact that they're having to look over their shoulder continuously to see what government's going to throw at them. Docs just want to care for patients. They want to focus on patient care. And yet, if they're working in an environment of uncertainty, new things being thrown at them, they can't focus on patients. And so I think your viewers should be concerned that so much of doctors' time and attention is being drawn away from patient care to look at what the government's throwing at them. It doesn't need to be this way. It can be better. Let's work together, let's find solutions, and stop creating such an adversarial situation. Do you feel politically demonized right now, as a group? As a group. Um, 
I think docs are feeling burned out. We have studies showing that. That's not what I'm asking. Do yeah. you feel politically demonized right now? Well, I wouldn't use that language. I think we feel beaten up. We feel beaten down. I think morale is lower than it's been in a long, long time. Having said that, if you were at our council meeting in the spring, where we have 300 docs spring and fall get together, there was a sense that we've been through so many dark days. Let's start looking forward to some solutions. Let's find some hope in all this blackness. Now, Minister Morneau's uh, um, tax changes in the middle of the summer didn't help. Uh, it certainly, it, 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 it decreased the morale again uh, to some extent. But on the other hand, it helped us all rally together around a common enemy to fight. Fo follow up on that if you would. What is, what is it specifically about the government's, the federal government's proposed tax changes that doctors find so inhospitable? Well, uh, again, the easiest way to describe it is that if you make cuts to health care, either by cutting fees or raising taxes, it will end up with less patient care. It's just a purely mathematical situation. Now, if you want to get into the specifics about income splitting or uh, taxes on retained yeah, sure. earnings and all the rest, um, we, can, we can unpack that. But just to say that we are one of 70 different business groups that are part of a coalition that are upset about this. Doctors actually only represent 12% of the small businesses that are, are being impacted by these proposed federal tax changes. I think we need the government to slow down to get this right. The last time we made this big of a change was with the Carter Commission, started in 1962, wrapped up in 1972. They're trying to do this in 75 days over the dead of summer when most people aren't even in office. Farmers are out harvesting their crops at the end of August. They're not reading about tax changes. So we're asking the federal government to slow down. Let's ask about the micro and macroeconomic impacts of these massive changes, and let's get this right. I have heard the argument that doctors use here that, okay, the tax changes that the federal government is proposing will hit them in the pocketbook. And the provincial government, in its previous fee negotiations, has clawed back doctors' incomes, and that hits them in the pocketbook. So you've got it sort of coming and going from both sides right now. That's the way I've had it described to me. However, here's the flip side of that argument, which is you guys never have an unpaid bill. you got one customer, the government of Ontario, and it pays 100% of its bills, unlike small business people who can get taken to the cleaners or you know people don't pay them or they're chasing people for bills all the time. Uh, you know, no one wants to get their pay cut back, but when you look at it from that point of view, do the small business people, in effect, have a have a better argument against these federal tax changes than you do. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think what you're getting at are, are doctors in a privileged position? I think we're privileged in many ways. It's a privilege to be able to care for patients. It's a privilege to be able to not worry about having to advertise to get patients. And there, there are many ways that it's a great opportunity to practice medicine in Ontario, to practice medicine in Canada. I think the issue is that when you make cuts, when you change the rules after decades in some places, as certainly BC, this has been in place since the 1970s, when you change the rules late in the game with only 75 days of consultation, this impacts not only physicians, but their staff. Physicians in Canada directly employ over 108,000 staff members. And it impacts the local communities. I work in a small community. There's a little pharmacy in town. If I'm out of business, the pharmacy struggles. Um, so there's multiple levels of impact, and ultimately it impacts patient care. And I can unpack sort of the specifics of how that happens, but we need to have that conversation. If we don't get this right, I think we're going to live to regret it. You've talked to the federal finance minister about this. Mm -hmm. Has ha, d d Do you come away from those conversations with the sense that he's prepared to make some changes to what he's offered? Well, Minister Morneau is a very bright guy, very smooth, well-spoken, and he met with a group of us. I was part of a Canadian Medical Association delegation, and his answer seemed very pat um, and, and very, very practiced. And at the end of our meeting, I said, you know, I have a ton more questions. I hope we can continue this conversation. And he said, yeah, you can speak to my chief of staff. But I happened to share a plane ride with him back to Toronto for an hour. Lucky him. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> so he sat down right next to me. He said, oh, good, you can ask me all those questions you had now, hmm. right? And I thought he was joking. And he sat down. He said, no, no, I'm serious. Ask me your questions. So I said, I'll ask just two. My first question was, how do you 
intend to maintain the concept of tax integration by eliminating the RDTOH, which is the refundable okay. dividend. Yeah, so Better anyways. Explain all that. Do what, yeah, so the mm -hmm. refundable dividend taxes on hand. How can you maintain that? My second question is, what are we gonna do about the margins of care? So the tax changes that he's proposing will hit the smaller practices much more than it will the larger practices, just simply because the smaller practices have a smaller margin. And, and his response was, you're right, we haven't figured it out. So when you're talking about maintaining tax integration and eliminating the RDTOH, which is an accounting maneuver um, that makes it such that a dollar flowing through a corporation attracts the same effective tax rate as a dollar that flows through a salary. So they haven't worked out how to operationalize that. So for that reason alone, I think they need to take some time talk to the experts, consult with the business community, consult with everyone, and really do this properly. Do you think that the federal finance minister and the prime minister, for that matter, have an understanding that what they refer to as dead money sitting in the corporate accounts of small business people and presumably doctors as well uh, is actually less dead money and more what you rely on because you don't have a pension and is money that you're sort of saving for a rainy day? Do yeah, they get it, that? Well, it's hard to call something dead money if you're surviving on that dead money mm -hmm. if you have a bad business cycle or if you have a crop that fails or if you need to expand your clinic. I mean, this money is the retained capital is what you use to run your business. At a town hall last week when we spoke with Mr. Murnau on Friday morning, you probably saw it on the media, a gentleman stood up and he said, when I started as a salaried person, I only had $100,000 debt on my house. Now I started a small business and I'm holding five to six hundred thousand dollars debt on my house personal mortgage to fund his small business and so that's not even part of the conversation the amount of risk that family units take on to support this pillar of the Canadian economy I think we need to get that into the conversation okay in our last couple of minutes here let me come full circle and talk about your challenge within the OMA mm -hmm. namely you have come into this job at a you know kind of at a very unusual time uh, the previous leadership of the OMA was thrown out. There are high hopes and expectations that you, both because of the proximity of the next election and because the fight between you and the province has gone on so long and so hard, mm -hmm. there are high expectations that you are somehow going to find, however you define this, a win for doc I'm spelling it W-I-N, not W-Y-N-N-E, a win for the province's doctors. How are you handling that pressure? Um, well, I, we were talking before the, before the segment started. I think it's a great opportunity for anyone to make improvements if you step into a situation that's in crisis. The, the funny thing about the Ontario Medical Association is that we've had very similar structures for decades, and it's only until we had the incredible pressure put upon us from the provincial government initially that those cracks in our organization started to show. And so this has actually been an opportunity for us to revisit our mission, vision, values. We've got a new strategic plan. We're just coming to the end of a massive governance review for at our board level. So we're decreasing 59 committees down to three core committees, giving more power to the membership and we're doing an operational review. So we're really in the midst of a turnaround and I hope stakeholders in the healthcare community will notice a different OMA functions different, sounds different, and adds different kinds of value to the healthcare system. So that's our goal. Uh, we'll be reporting on that in November to the membership. And I think by spring, folks like you and everybody else who's watching from the outside should see some concrete changes. And just last thing, you know, back in the day, doctors were really quite revered, both individually and as a collective group in the province of Ontario. And, um, you know, they were very much self-governing professionals. They, whenever they fought with government, they tended to win. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the old joke used to be that the governments used to wrestle doctors to the ceiling when it came to floor, uh, fee negotiations. Those days are gone. You are clearly a group that's having more power taken away from you. Doctors are not, uh, excuse me, the province is not afraid to take you on. Um, are we at a new time in the image of doctors in our province where you guys just are not it's a new day, and you're not going to be as revered as you once were, and the public tend to look at you maybe as just another special interest group trying to do good by your members, and, you know, that's where it's at. Yeah, so, so we've done research on this, and I think physicians still love their individual, as physicians, patients still love their individual doctors, and they're devoted to them, and, and certainly that's my experience as a clinician with my patients. They seem to appreciate what I do. I appreciate 
the, uh, the honor of serving them. When you talk, start talking about doctors writ large as a group, as a stakeholder interest, our, the, the appreciation from the public drops substantially. And it's the same for other groups in healthcare as well. Um, having said that, has there been a shift? I think absolutely. Society has changed in the last 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, people have different expectations of, of um, experts and professionals. People have a different level of respect to established bodies, uh, author authority, that sort of thing. And, and we have to exist within that and still strive to deliver excellent patient care within that. So that's what we're about. Your life is our life's work. And so somewhere in that, at the same time as we're fighting for... Um, for better funding and a better situation for physicians so that we can care for patients. At the end of the day, we're all in this to try to improve patient care. And with that, Dr. Watley, we thank you for coming into TVO tonight and sharing your views. That's Dr. Sean Watley, new president, Ontario Medical Association. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.